It's on a little bitty piece of paper <laughs> if you want to follow along. Being a child is a wonderful thing. It's a time in our lives where we we where we learn right from wrong. If we never learn the difference between right and wrong, why well, we'd end up in an absolute mess, wouldn't we? We wouldn't know boundaries. We would literally tear each other apart. Some would kind of try to control others. Well, it might even look like, see, I've lived too long now. It might look like what we're looking at in our culture today. It's a wonderful thing to be a child and to learn the difference between right and wrong. But as Paul says in another place, the thing that I want to do, I, well, I can't do. At least not all the time. My addition. The thing I want to do, I cannot do. The thing that I don't want to do is the very thing that I, I do. And then he calls himself a wretch, and that's kind of what we often think of ourselves. Is that true? When we can't do the thing that we want to do, when we fail, we feel wretched. And then Paul says, but thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. When we were children, we were taught right from wrong. And it works real well in much of life. But it doesn't work out that well when it comes to sin. The same rules don't apply to the working out of full salvation. That's what we sang about a little while ago. About full salvation, not just part. You see, we've been warned not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For in the moment that we eat of it, what will happen, church? We'll die. But the death that we will die is a death to sin. And the death to sin will separate us from the love of God. And I, don't, I have not met a single person that attended church more than once, that wanted to be separated from God. Last week I used this measuring cup as a metaphor. The measure you give. You understand that what I have to offer you this morning, if it has any value, if it has any truth, if we're to offer one another anything of any value, of any truth, if we're to offer one another anything of value and truth, then we first must receive it from the Lord. You see, the law is good. It was received by Moses at Mount Sinai. But understand what the law does. It teaches us right from wrong. Do you know that there are 612 commands in this cup? Do you know that there are 612 commands in the Old Testament? And if we're going to live by the law, then we have to keep all 612. 
Because to break one of them, it's to break all of them because it all fits in the same cup. Paul was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, you remember? We learned that in Sunday school, Paul, before he came to know Christ, was a Pharisee. He was a student of the 612 law, laws, commands. He knew all 612. And not only did he know the 612, but what the Pharisees would do is much what you and I do. Let's just admit it. We do this. We find one command in the law, and then we set about telling each other a set of rules how to keep that one law. And so where there's 612, we end up with literally hundreds of thousands and what we end up doing it's going on right now. It's been going on as long as the church has been around, debating and arguing how to keep the law. The question is, do we want to remain children like Saul and be Pharisees of Pharisees the rest of our lives? Or do we want to become the men and women of God? And so, look at your note here follow along. The Old Covenant, you see the Old Covenant, the Old Testament is like a measuring cup. And all I'm trying to say is that there's some stuff that belongs in this cup and the Apostle Paul talks about it if we listen closely. It contains the law, circumcision, and flesh. Let's see if I can make sense of this right quick. It's all in this one cup. We know what the law is. That's the Old Testament. There's 612 commands. They all fit in this cup. It's a measure. Circumcision. It's an outward sign. Circumcision is an outward sign. It is a reminder I don't want to be crude here. And I'm not being crude. I'm just trying to make things simple. Every time a person who is circumcised would go to do their daily business, they would be reminded multiple times in the day that they had made a covenant with God that they would keep all 612 of the commands that are in this cup. Circumcision is an outward sign to remind the one who is circumcised that they must keep all 612. And then there's the flesh. This is kind of hard to get to. You'll just kind of have to trust me or go do a whole lot of reading on your own. And if you want to do the reading on your own, come see me. I'll point you to the books, to the ones I agree with and the ones I disagree with. That's the only way you're going to learn. But the flesh, quite simply, is this. Do you have a conscience that bothers you? We've talked about this. Do you have... Come on, church. I have a conscience. Do you have a conscience that bothers you? Yeah, that's the flesh. You see, it goes like this. There's 612, and we, there's 612 commands. We want to keep them. There's not a child out there that doesn't want to be good. We want to keep them. And then we have this outward sign. Kind of breaks down because we're not all circumcised, are we? You see how, you see how we can't even talk about certain things in church? Good gosh. But we all have a conscience that nags at us. And it will remind us every time that we break... Is that right? Somebody, somebody nodded their head. Every time we break one of those rules, one of those commands, one of those laws, our conscience will set in to bother us. But as it says right here, look with me. Look at the fifth chapter of Galatians. 
Verse 14, for the whole law is summed up in one single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you're not consumed by one another. Have you ever done this? I have. My conscience is bothering me so bad that I go about trying to fix myself. Or my consciousness is bothering me so much, I've decided that I really won't, let's see, let me pick on somebody today. Oh, I'll pick on Ashley. You know, if I could just fix Ashley, if you know Ashley, I don't know that she's fixable. You see, if you're covered in grace, you don't need to be fixed. You need to be loved. But sometimes it's just simpler to bite, bite and devour my neighbor, wanting Ashley to live in a way that I know that I can't live, but if I could just hold you accountable, and if you would live it, then maybe I could believe it. You see, we're on the right path. We're looking for somebody that could fulfill it. We're looking, aren't we? We're looking for somebody that could actually do that. Paul has met that somebody. So have you. You see, there's a new covenant. What's in this cup? What's in the cup of the new covenant? What measure would we find in this cup? You see, the new covenant is like a measuring cup too. Paul says, I'm just using Paul's words. Freedom. Freedom from what? (laughs) Yay! Freedom from the sinful nature. How are we freed from the sinful nature? The next word is grace. Grace is a free gift. It can't be earned. Parents, you know what this is about. No matter what your children do, no matter matter how heinous it is, you're going to do your best to love them. And if you're capable of doing that, if we're capable of doing that, how much more is our Father capable of? By showing us his love through Jesus Christ. So there's freedom and there's grace, but there's something else in this cup. It's the Holy Spirit. So let me just try to show you what I think, what I believe. Let me show you what I've experienced. Because at the end of the day, the only measure I have to give you is what I've experienced. This is old covenant, and this is a new covenant. Now, we're tempted to say which one we want, and I'm going to tell you that ain't going to work. But try it. Every child does to become an adult. You've got to test and try all of it. So knock yourself out. But here's what I've experienced. And we prayed about it a little while ago. Remember that part of the Lord's Prayer? Lead us not into temptation. Remember that? I'll tell you what I'm tempted not to do. I'm tempted not to forgive you because I want you to change. I'm tempted not to forgive you. But I'll tell you one even worse than that. I'm tempted not to forgive myself. In other words, I'm tempted to look Jesus Christ in the face and to say, oh, I am so unworthy that I'm not going to forgive myself, but now, Lord, you know I'll do my best to change. How's that working for you right now? So don't throw either one of these away. Learn how they fit together. And that's what the Apostle Paul's trying to teach us, is how these fit together. 
Lead us not into temptation, but what, church? Deliver us from... Now, the next time that your conscience is bothering you, you know, like right about now, because <laughs> you don't know if you agree with me or not, and that's okay. The next time your conscience bothers you, would you just consider this? That you're just like the Apostle Paul when our conscience bothers us. The Holy Spirit is at work in our lives to prevent us from doing what we want to do. And if we're prevented from doing what we want to do, guess what we will do? We'll do what the Lord has called us to do. Let me put it in another way. Lead me not from the temptation of giving you this, but allow the Holy Spirit to take this to take this, all of those 612 laws, and everything that we can add to them, and to get us to name it and to see it, what we're afraid of, what's dividing and separating us, just name it, and watch what the Lord will do with it. The Holy Spirit will lead us to freedom. Is that complicated? The Holy Spirit will lead us to freedom. Isn't that the Exodus story? Isn't that exactly what God did? Isn't that exactly what God did? That He sent Moses down into Egypt to deliver His people from slavery. And where did He deliver them to? To the wilderness. And what is that wilderness called? It's called sin. You see, the first move is to be set free from the world. And then the second move is in the promised land, my friends. Because the promise is, is that He would send another comforter, another advocate, the Holy Spirit, the one that will deliver us from sin into the kingdom of heaven. Let me put it another way. I keep talking about the same thing. When we find ourselves in fear, because we know on the inside that the works of the flesh are obvious, I'll raise my hands on the ones that I know that I have done in my life. You just raise your heart to the Lord. Fornication, impurity, I'm not sure that I re really remember what licentiousness is. Idolatry, I've never practiced sorcery. Enmity, oh yes. Yeah. Strife, yes. Yeah. Jealousy, yes. Anger, yes. I've had more than one quarrel with church people, yes. Dissensions, oh you bet. Factions, envy, drunkenness, I uh, did that one time. Carousing. Oh yeah, I've done that too. And things like this. I've done all those things. And I'm still tempted to do those things. But here the good news is that every time we're tempted, the Holy Spirit is present to deliver us from temptation not into, to deliver us from temptation so that we won't fall into the evil and we'll stop devouring one another and live in grace. You see, I really am crazy. It's a whole lot easier to stand up as a pastor and say, God loves you and let me tell you why. And you walk out the door feeling good but can't figure out how to love one another. I'm trying to teach us how to take what we believe and to put it into practice. Because my friends, the very thing that the Apostle Paul feared would happen is happening today. We're turning back to live by the law. 
We're eating one another alive. But just remember this. That Jesus Christ, we believe, took all of our sin, and all of our temptation, and all of our evil, and He took it to a cross at Calvary, and He transformed it into the image of God's freedom and God's grace and the gift of the Holy Spirit that you received in your baptism. In a few weeks, we'll talk about how to be led by the Spirit. And in the meantime, my telephone number is in the bulletin. It's there for a reason. You have questions. I don't have your questions. I have my answers. But when we get together and talk and pray together, you know what happens? I get new answers. That's how important you are. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I'll try to hush. Amen.